Hi and welcome to April's Hair Story with me Karen Bartlett. I'm just out in the fields near where I live and um, just in this lovely place where there's a, a broken down dead tree. I don't know if you can see a bit of it here as I tilt the camera um, and just reflecting really that um, you know our God can bring anything back to life and um, this spring we've got so much colour all around us now and everywhere looks so pretty and bursting with life and even these little um, buds on all the trees just remind us that there's going to be plenty of life, plenty of leaves, plenty of hopefully flowers and um, it's just this spot here where I am is normally really quiet but it's been like Euston Station and I've been stood here for ages waiting for people to pass by with their dogs and the small children and there's just a real sense you know that lockdown is easing and that things are getting better but uh, all that said just to say obviously um, 1st of May um, I want to tell you in advance that Faye Simmons Faye Ellen Simmons, formerly Beadle, will be giving us her story, her life and how she came into a real relationship with Jesus Christ. But today, uh, without any further ado, I want to say welcome and, uh, you know, hello and really go for it, Angela Clark. I've known you a long time. You're a wonderful woman of God and uh, we look forward to hearing about your journey into faith. So here we are, Angela Clark. Take it away. Bye. Hi everyone. My name is Angela Clark. I'm a member of Riverside Church in Bewdley. I'm originally from Warwickshire, but I've lived in Worcestershire ever since I was married and I love it. We are so blessed here with beautiful countryside and I think amazing people. When I was asked to tell my story, because I'm of a certain age, it is rather a long story. So it was quite hard to decide what part I was going to share with you. So I've simply decided to share my journey from formal religion through a period of atheism and into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I have a brother and a sister and I was the youngest of the three. We grew up in a Catholic family where church was quite a big part of our lives. We went to mass every Sunday. My sister and I went to convent school. But almost from my earliest recollections, I struggled to find reality in the faith that I'd been born into. I never seemed to be able to make a connection with God. He seemed distant and unreachable. And I went through the motions, of course, and tried my best to be a good Catholic girl, but I was destined to fail, which brought a lot of guilt and fear into my life, to be honest. It never entered my head that God loved me. I was quite sure he wouldn't even like me. And I personally found church so dull and boring, I couldn't work out how anyone would really desire to go. So, in my late teens, I decided to give up on all this God stuff. I suppose I think I was an atheist at that time. So I went off to do my own thing and hit the 60s and 70s scene uh, full on. They do say if you can remember the 60s, then you probably weren't there. But unfortunately for me, I do remember lots of it and it wasn't pretty. <laughs> I can hardly believe looking back, it was me who did all those things. In my 20s, I left home and joined a branch of British Airways as a flight attendant, which was just another vehicle for lots of wild living uh, around the globe. I like to think that air crews today are a lot more sober and responsible than we were. I do hope so. 
Eventually, I calmed down and got a job back on the ground, which is where I met my husband, David. He was 29 and he'd already lost a wife with cancer. And he was very angry with God at that time. In fact, we made quite an anti-God kind of couple, really. And our marriage didn't turn out to be the happily ever after experience that we had dreamed of. I think we both wanted to love each other, but because of our backgrounds and the difference in our personalities, we couldn't seem to coexist without fighting. We were both desperately unhappy really, but do you know, we never once thought of turning to God for help. Fortunately though, God was about to break into our lives. The couple next door moved out, <laughs> it could have been our rouse, and a born again girl moved in. She invited us to a Christian event at the Kidderminster Town Hall and I immediately said to David, no way, I've done the God thing, it doesn't work. And at this same point in time, we had a Christian builder in our house. And he was very upfront about his faith. In fact, to be honest, he got right up my nose. <laughs> I told him uh, I didn't want to know. I tried it and it didn't work. And he said, um, in what way didn't it work? So I gave it him full barrels. You know, I said something like there's no reality in it. God isn't there. He doesn't respond to me. I can't find him. And I said, I was told 2000 years ago that Jesus died on the cross for me, uh, for my sins. And I said, so how, how does that affect me here and now? Do you know, I used to ask the nuns that question and I never really received a satisfactory answer. His next question took me by surprise. He asked, well, have you ever asked Jesus to be your personal saviour? Because although Jesus died on the cross for the whole world, unless you personally avail yourself of that gift and ask him to forgive your sins, you won't be able to find him because the Bible tells us that your sin acts like a barrier between you and God. That left me quite speechless actually. I couldn't believe that I'd been in church for 20 years and taken scripture and RE for O level. And yet nobody had ever told me about this personal thing. I think I thought the death of Jesus covered everybody in the world by some kind of osmosis or something. So somehow or other, David and I agreed to go to this town hall event. And I don't remember much about the content of the evening because it was as though I was having a one-to-one -one with God on the inside. The speaker began to explain what the gospel of Jesus Christ actually means. And I'd never actually heard it explained this way before. The word gospel, of course, means good news. And I discovered actually that there was some bad news, but closely followed by some very good news. The bad news I accepted that night was that I was a sinner and I could actually not do anything to change that myself. My upbringing had been all about what I could do to try and appease God. I went to mass, I went to confession, I did penance, I said the rosary and generally tried to be a better person. But nothing changed my nature or my cycle of failure. But the good news I learned that night is it's not about what I can do. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. It's all about what Jesus has already done on the cross for my sins. He took my punishment. 
And the Bible also says, for God so loved the world. We often think of God as this person out to spoil our fun and with a big stick in the sky. But it says he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in, trusts in, relies on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. At the end of the evening, the speaker told us from the Bible what we now needed to do. If I wanted a new beginning, a new birth, and have all my sins forgiven, all I had to do with a sincere heart was to turn away from my sins and my old life and ask Jesus to be my personal saviour. The speaker invited anyone who wanted this to come to the front and pray a meaningful prayer. It wasn't difficult for me to accept that I was a sinner, but I didn't realise until then that the worst sin of all is to live without God and to shut him out of your life. Without realising, I turned my back on God and the one who gave me life, he's my creator. And I ignored the gift of Jesus. And in my stubborn pride, I wanted to be in control of my own life. Do you know, my heart was bursting. I could hardly wait to get to the front. I knew that this was the missing piece of the jigsaw in me finding God for real. Amazingly, I never even stopped to think what David would think or what my friends would think about this crazy decision. I just wanted it with all my heart. It's hard to put into words what I felt like that night, but I felt like a child running into the security of her father's arms. I now know that I became spiritually born again on that day. The Bible says that it means born from above or born of God. You receive God's Holy Spirit who takes up residence inside you and gives you the power to live the Christian life. My thinking began to change radically and I became instantly aware of my tendency to sin. The decision I made that day has changed my life forever. And since that day, God has been real, he's been intimate, and he's been my closest friend. The craziest turnaround of all was I actually wanted to go to church and nobody was more surprised than me. I found a great church with good teaching and I began to grow in leaps and bounds in my new faith. I was the first person in my family to experience this spiritual new birth. But since that day, many of my family and friends have made the decision to turn away and follow Jesus. My mum was the first, followed by my sister and then her teenagers and many friends after that. And I watched them come alive from making the transition from a life of religious observance to a personal relationship with God. My husband came to church with me from the beginning, but it took quite a few years before he really surrendered his life to God. But once he did, he became a changed and somehow emotionally healed man. Both David and I experienced new softened hearts. We began to love each other in a deep way and God showed us how to appreciate the difference in our personalities. Jesus was at the centre of our home and I can honestly say I felt truly alive for the first time in my life. The Bible says you become a new creation the old has gone, the new has come. And that's why when I look back on that old Angela, 
I don't even recognise her anymore because God has made me new. But there are two things I would like to say about my new life in Christ that haven't turned out quite how I might have expected. One is that my changes haven't all happened by magic. I've discovered that the key to being truly born again is in the word repentance. And it's a word we don't hear much of today, but it means to turn around, to change my mind, and to surrender to the will of God. Repentance isn't a feeling, it's an action word. And it's uh, not about feeling sorry for my sin, but deciding to change direction. By nature, I have bad temper. My dad also had a very short fuse. So I always used to say, well, I've got my father's temper. When David and I were first married um, and I kicked off in one of my tantrums, he would rush round the house shutting all the windows so that the neighbours couldn't hear. I mean, how shameful is that? I soon began at this point to experience uh, the sensation of God speaking to me. Not in an audible voice, of course, but rather getting a sense of what he was saying deep down inside. One day I was using my usual experience of having my father's temper when God spoke straight to my heart. He said, well, you've got a new father now and you can have my temperament, but you've got to decide. So since that day, God has given me the power to keep that temper largely under control, largely. And the second thing that is not quite what I expected is this. Maybe um, I thought that now I'd become a Christian, I was gonna live happily ever after. And maybe I was confusing Jesus with Father Christmas, I don't know. But I've had struggles, as everyone has, and I still have ongoing struggles. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. I've found that things don't always turn out as you would like, and I've had some serious times of heartache, and I have wrestled with God. And I don't tell you these things to extract sympathy from you, but rather to illustrate how God can sustain you day by day and still give you a blessed life, even when it's tough. The first thing that happened almost immediately after my conversion, um, around when I was 31, was that my mum was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I was absolutely heartbroken because we loved her so much. She was lovely, warm, wise, and I certainly wasn't ready to say goodbye. I had plans for sharing much life together. Of course, we prayed for healing and the church prayed for healing, but it wasn't to be. Almost at the same time, I discovered that I would probably not be able to have children. I was completely devastated because I'd never planned for anything else. And my husband had a huge fear of adoption, so that door was closed too. Each time one of my friends got pregnant, I broke my heart. I so wanted to enjoy family life like everyone else. I couldn't come to terms with it and I sought God constantly in prayer for healing. I also fought God. All the time I cried out, why not me? Why not me? Why can't I experience what everybody else has? When I was 
was around 38, 39, I went to a ladies' conference and I went to a seminar on intimacy with God. And I sat there expecting a really interesting talk. But when the speaker came out, she started by saying, I have a serious word from God that I think I need to deliver this morning. And I think God would say to you, stop contending with me. Wow. That word went straight into my heart and I knew that it was me. I spent the rest of the weekend weeping and attempting to lay down my hopes, my dreams, my desires, my pain, and I made the decision to trust God's will for my life. As I'd given him my life seven years ago, I had to decide to let him be in control. It was the hardest thing ever. It was very painful. It was like a death, I suppose. But from that day, my life, my attitude has been different towards it. I stopped fighting God, I guess. That doesn't mean that I don't still feel the longing and the loss. And to be honest, the envy of family life that others enjoy. But God has given me a different life. Um, he's filled it with good things and opportunities to serve him. He's made it up to me in so many ways. I've got a fantastic wider family and I've got the most amazing faithful friends. There are precious younger people in my life who feel like my spiritual children. And the final thing I'd like to share with you has also been a time when I wrestled with God. In 2012, David had been retired for about a year as he was a little older than me. And I was retiring to join him in the end of June. As you can imagine, I've been working all my life and I was looking forward to a new and different season together. But it was not to be. In the middle of June, with no warning and no apparent symptoms, David collapsed and died within three days. Unbeknown to us, he was suffering with acute pancreatitis. I was completely wiped out. I felt as if the ground had disappeared beneath my feet. As I'm sure any of you will know if you have suffered a shock death. So once again, I found myself fighting with God. I think the timing of it made it even harder to bear because I couldn't believe that Father God would allow that to happen. How could this happen now in our retirement month? But because I'd been walking with God by this time for 30 years and through life experience and reading my Bible, I'd learned much about the character of God. And this whole scenario didn't seem to match up with the God that I thought I knew. I kept walking around the house saying out loud, Father, this seems so cruel. But I know that you are not cruel. Everything I know about you tells me otherwise. I have some dear American friends who David and I love very much. And they, of course, phoned me to comfort me. And Jim, who is a church pastor, shared a word with me that did help and once again, I slowly, and I say slowly, worked my way towards surrendering my situation to the will of God. I'll share the word with you. Jim is someone who is really tuned in 
to hearing God speak in the most ordinary of situations. He once heard God speak when he was watching the movie Men in Black. Well, you explain that, but that's Jim. He was at this time of the story he was telling, he was at the vets, about to have his doggy best friend, Buddy, put to sleep because of cancer. While they were sitting in the waiting room, the dog sheltered under Jim's legs uh, and looked up at him with trusting eyes, apparently, as if to say, I know I'm going to be okay because I'm under my dad's legs. Jim said the look of trust in the dog's eyes broke his heart. So he bent down and said to the dog, the thing is, buddy, I have information that you don't know about. And Jim said, as soon as the words were out of his mouth, he felt God saying, that's exactly how it works. I'm your father. I love you. You can trust me with your life. But sometimes I have information that you don't and I've considered that story many times since David's death and it slowly made me decide that I was going to trust my Heavenly Father with my life and my future no matter what even when I don't understand it I love God not for what he gives me but because he sent Jesus to die for me on the cross and now I have forgiveness of sins for past, present and future. Because Jesus has become my personal saviour, I now have the promise of eternal life. My place in heaven is not dependent on my performance. It's the gift of God. So, no matter what happens, nothing can take that from me. My Bible tells me whether I live or die, I am his. And I just want to finally say that I am still as excited and somehow still as surprised by this amazing relationship with Jesus as I was when it first happened 40 years ago. Thanks for listening.